morning. Um, my name is uh, Tim McFadden, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I, together with Cindy Teasdale McGowan, uh, our co-chairman of the program committee of MVF. Um, I'm also a partner at Posnelli in the corporate and transactions group, and I'm chairman of the startup ventures group at our firm. Um, it is my honor today to introduce to you our keynote speaker, our keynote speaker Dr. Jared Glasscock. And I've got to say, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've seen a lot of impressive bios, but this one is really impressive. Um, Dr. Glasscock has spent the last 20 years bringing, um, bridging molecular genetics, computer science, and sequencing technologies to provide insight to molecular systems. During his decade at Washington University's Genome Sequencing Center, Dr. Glasscock led a team of scientists to characterize and publish NIH-funded sequencing projects, including contributing to the Human Genome Project. In 2008, Dr. Glasscock left the faculty position at Washington University to found Cofactor Genomics. Over the last eight years, the company has seen unprecedented and phenomenal growth. In 2015, Cofactor was honored by receiving the backing of Y Combinator, which I think, as we all know, is one of the top um, and most successful startup investment programs in the world based in Silicon Valley. Um, under, under Dr. Glasscock's leadership, which you're going to hear about today, um, they've developed unique RNA-based technologies that will be used in the fight against cancer and neurological diseases. Um, Dr. Glasscock also serves on the St. Louis University Industry Advisory Board, and he has three separate bachelor degrees from the University of Arizona in science, biology, and computer science, and he has three PhDs from Washington University and the Washington University School of Medicine in molecular genetics, computational biology, and genetics. And I give you Dr. Glasscock. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's quite an honor this morning to, uh, to be here. And uh, what I'm told is the format is to spend about 15 minutes or 20 minutes um, giving a little bit of our story and then allowing about 15 minutes or 20 minutes for questions. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, just, uh, uh, um, um, just so that uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, not given credit or, or more credit than I, than I should. Um, I have a, a, a degree in, in uh, computational biology and, and genetics, a PhD from Washington University. Not three c separate PhDs, but, uh, but, I, I, but that's okay. I've been, I've been uh, um, you know, accused of worse things. So, uh, but, but thank you for the very nice introduction. That's very nice of you. Um, okay, so let me start off. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, cofactor genomics. And really, in order to understand cofactor genomics, um, it's important to talk about the origin. And that origin really started at Washington University um, here in St. Louis, where I came to be a part of this Human Genome Project, which was a very exciting project at the time. If you don't know much about the Human Genome Project, um, what's important to know is it's this combination of technology and talent in order to give us a human insight, insight into biology, insight into medicine. And it was something that I was extremely excited um, to move from the Southwest uh, to St. Louis about 17, 18 years ago and, and become a part of. So what's important here is this middle part, um, which was there were thousands of biologists, uh, programmers, technologists, we had physicists, um, really a diverse group working all over the United States, working um, in, in different countries as well. And that was the first time I had been exposed to this kind of diversity in, in a working group. And to be you know, part of a group that were, um, you know, had such a diverse background working on a difficult problem. So something very exciting happened at the end of this human genome project. And, um, like any time you get a lot of passionate, uh, talented individuals together, uh, there's some exciting things that come out of that. One of those things were, were technologies and these DNA sequencing technologies. So to give you a, a, some perspective, on the left is one of the DNA sequencers that was used to sequence the Human Genome Project. Um, that was a project that took 10 years, um, roughly about $3 billion or so dollars to do that first human genome. And the new technology that came out after the end of that project was a sequencer, which was one of those was the equivalent of about 10,000 of the machines that it took to, to sequence the Human Genome Project. Um, so 
you know, the, the joke uh, in the laboratory became, wow, with one of these sequencers, um, all it takes is three guys in a garage to be now a, a genome center. And that was a joke that, that probably existed at lunch for a period of about a year or maybe even going on two. Um, and what we realized were there were a number of industries, academia, um, pharmaceutical, agriculture, um, coming to the university to gain access to these technologies. And, and that's really where the idea of cofactor came from, was that there was an opportunity for a business to, to allow and give access to all these different industries um, to this powerful technology and, and give insight to that biology. So, see here. Um, so, we became those three guys in a garage in 2008, end of 2008, beginning of 2009. Um, we were a group of, of past human genome scientists, worked together for about 10 years uh, together. And, and um, really, the, the, the way that we started was uh, founder debt, um, which is a story in and of itself. Um, you can't really see because of this slide here, but there's a, a, a faint blue image that, that represents our sequencer um, that was about a half a million dollar purchase for us. And after about three months of, of selling our um, sequencing services to a number of large institutions, we found out about five days before the delivery of our first instrument that we had been turned down for the financing of that instrument um, because we didn't have three years of financials because we were three months old. Um, so that uh, was a very stressful time, and it resulted in, in putting a number of things, including a second mortgage of, of my home, um, and a number of things on our personal credit cards to get things moving so that we could collect the money from these contracts that we had, we had just sold. Um, so in order to, to complete that gap and really get things going, we took on about $200,000 of friends and family uh, funding. And we started out in a 700 square foot um, studio. Um, it was um, something we found on Craigslist for about $700 a month. And it took our scientists about, about three months to build that uh, photography studio into a functioning lab that could handle um, you know, samples uh, from, from all over the world. So that was an exciting time. So, one of the things I didn't realize, and, and you know, we started this venture with, you know, we had a, a, an MBA from WashU on our, on our team and our founding team, um, and a 78-page business plan. You know, so we were, we were really, you know, had it all figured out. What we didn't realize was the importance of, of these founder sales. And what was great about found, uh, ha having founder sales be a, a part of our business is we had more insight into all the industries and the way those industries were going to use these technologies than any report we could have purchased you know, at the time. Um, we were literally in front of um, about 1,200 different individuals over the, a period of a, a few years. And that gave us some really good insight into where this technology was going to be very fruitful and, and quite frankly, where it was not going to fit. So, this is meant to represent really all of, the, all of the industries we were working with in those early days. Um, ultimately, which I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute, we chose to focus on this corner that talks about drug development. And um, also, the second twist to that is, is we had focused our whole career on DNA sequencing. What we found out was RNA was actually a very good fit um, for enabling this area of personalized medicine. Kind of a funny aside, um, a project that we hadn't anticipated at the time um, was Ozzy Osbourne. Um, we sequenced the genome of Ozzy Osbourne within our first uh, year of being open. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, maybe one of our most interesting uh, projects we ever did. Um, and I, I had somebody ask me last night, you know, why, why is it that you guys did that project? And uh, why were we approached with that project? And I think the answer to that was, at the time, you had these large, large academic centers doing DNA sequencing. Um, and we were one of the very first that was a young startup that had the background, but we're also moving very quickly and aggressively. And um, one of the terms I heard referred to us at this time in like 2009, 2010, was that we were the young Turks of genomics. And, um, 
and this is the reason why the groups approached us uh, for this project. So very interesting project. That's a 15-minute that's a conversation and uh, presentation in and of itself. Um, so one of the things that we learned through this process is that actually, you know, something that we focused our entire career on, which was DNA, uh, we learned that you know, essentially about 95% of diseases could not be diagnosed with DNA. And the reason for that is you hear many times DNA referred to as a blueprint over here on the left. And um, many times more recently you hear of, of RNA referred to as a barometer. And those are two very important terms um, that are attributed to both of those genetic materials. And the reason why is, is a blueprint is very much fixed and very rarely changes over your lifetime. Um, you know, of course, there's some exceptions to that, but in general, that's, that's the rule. Um, whereas RNA is actually constantly changing. It's changing in response to diet, exercise, infection, and disease. And really, working on the Human Genome Project, where we were having to work with RNA um, to incorporate that information, it became kind of a thorn in our side because it was always changing. And you know, little did we know, a number of years later, this would actually be a perfect molecule to monitor and to early detect disease, um, to understand treatment, and if there was you know, treatment for disease, to understand if that treatment was effective. You could actually use this dynamic molecule for really bringing personalized medicine you know, to fruition. So I'm not going to talk a lot about all of our products and our services, um, but it is probably relevant to note that um, today, uh, Cofactor has about 80% of its revenue from, from nine large pharmaceutical companies, and they are using RNA to understand disease, and um, really to understand that disease, to understand what are the different types of, of disease um, that, um, you know, you might call something either, um, you know, multiple sclerosis or um, kidney cancer. But when you look more closely at those diseases, they're actually a collection of, of sub-diseases. And RNA is giving them that information to understand that. So fast forward to today. That was um, 2008 funding, um, and, uh, 2008 um, um, when we started. Uh, if we look at 2016, we have nine of the world's largest pharma under contract. Um, we took that $200,000 angel investment um, and have generated more than $12 million of total revenue from that 200,000. This is a little bit of an outdated number because we're actually higher than that now, and we've also brought on additional funding um, from the summer with Y Combinator and some, some people that followed Y Combinator into that, into that funding. Uh, $1.5 million of NIH funding um, to support the use of RNA as, as this, uh, this diagnostic. And we've built out a 10,000 square foot facility in the Cortex District um, within the last two years to really support the type of work that we're focused on, both in terms of the R&D and the, and the unique technologies we're developing, as well as bringing in thousands of samples a year uh, from the research institutions and um, the pharmaceutical companies that are using RNA in this way. Um, we already noticed that, I'm, that we're backed by Y Combinator. Um, following that, that backing, we had a, a seed uh, funding that took place, and that was for us to go after specific diseases uh, to develop diagnostic tests for. This list of diseases, half of them are, fall on the cancer side, and the other half of them fall in the neurological or uh, um, neurodegenerative diseases uh, would be the other half of the list. Um, as, as noted, we, we um, had a very exciting acquisition of a small uh, startup that uh, was spun out of Stanford. Uh, and this is a great group to join us because they have a background in biomarker development and, and identifying these markers for disease. And their background has really been on the neurological or neurodegenerative side. And that's, that was really something missing from our team for us to go this direction. And Series A, which, is, uh, which will probably be our next uh, you know, hurdle. And, and we're probably about 12 months or 18 months away from that. that. So um, one of the hardest things was we were 
somewhat far along, um, we had had a number of contracts and um, we had to ask whether this aspect of Y Combinator made sense for a company like ours. And it, it seems silly even to say that out loud in hindsight, um, but it, it was something that, you know, us as a company, we had to think about, well, wait a minute, you know, this is a, is a accelerator that was, um, you know, historically involved with tech companies, very early stage, usually like at the ideation uh, stage, and, and we were a different kind of company. And um, what we realized was, was the things that we needed for our next round of growth, uh, which were people that knew how to build very large, successful companies, um, as well as access to funding, quite frankly. Uh, this step in, in becoming a, a Y Combinator company made a lot of sense for us. Uh, but I, I can tell you right on the surface, those, that first uh, week or two of conversation about whether we were gonna aggressively pursue uh, y Combinator, um, it, it wasn't it wasn't 100% obvious that we would, and much to the to the encouragement of of Dave Messina, our CSO, uh, I'm sorry, our COO, um, you know, we we went that path, and and it's been really great the last six months as a result of that. One of the biggest things I had to learn um, about two years ago, uh, it was really painful giving my first VC talks. Uh, I had spent I had spent you know, at least 10 years of my life in uh, academic research. And I was used to giving these hour-long talks where I talked about the science or the product. And maybe at the very end, I might make a mention of, oh yeah, there's a couple of other things out there. And um, just while we're wrapping up, here's a couple of names of our team uh, that worked on it. And that was really how all of those talks went for 10 years. And I really had to, to flip my, my approach around uh, one of the things you'll notice is um, that's a 60-minute talk on the left. That's, a, that's an eight-minute talk on the right. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't even getting started at eight minutes uh, in the old style. So, so it was really something that I had to struggle with for a while. And, and we were talking earlier here today where you, know, you have to talk to sometimes 30, 40, 50 VCs to find a really good match between you and your team. And um, I wish I could go back and apologize to probably the first 20 VCs I talked to, because I, I just killed them with, with um, detail and you know, technology, and uh, I just feel so bad for them. So, so this, was, this was really a, a, a change you know, in, in the way I was, I mean, really trained for more than a dozen years to talk about what I do. Um, and ultimately, as an aside, this is actually a blog post that I wrote was a struggle of, of um, I wrote unlearning your PhD um, in order to, 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 to be able to communicate and to be able to talk. And this was actually what um, got the attention of Y Combinator and the reason why they reached out to us is after they saw this blog post. So that was a, a very big learning lesson for us. Um, myth three, swag is a waste. So, I literally, no less than at least three times, um, I've walked into a, a, you know, a VC meeting or a VC conference, and I've been told by other companies, mm, you, you better lose the, the, the orange jackets, you better lose the you know, swag. Uh, investors hate swag, it's a waste of money, you're spending their money frivolously, it's you know, a horrible idea, lose that swag. And um, it's something I've kind of taken issue with over the last two years, because one of the most important things and the things I spend a lot of my time and my nights thinking about is how to build a cohesive team and a successful team. And as silly as it sounds, these, you know, these $30 orange jackets really builds a lot of pride. And even when I left you know, the labs last night and, and there's people working there at 8.30 working on things, I, I saw you know, they're wearing their cofactor orange jackets or they're wearing the black um, shirts. And there's this aspect of pride I think you have on any team. And whatever you can do to foster that, I think, is, is so important. So it's kind of a, a, a joke, but um, it is funny. Ah. So in our last facility, specifically the one that we've built in Cortex, um, we spent a lot of time thinking, and, and really to the credit of, of our, the, the group we worked with, Arcturus, um, thinking about the environment and how we were going to allow um, the interactions 
and as Travis you know, uh, refers to it, is, is, is these types of um, collisions and, and, uh, and, and creating an environment where it really encourages that. And here's just a couple of pictures from our, our current facility. And we spent a lot of time thinking about environment. Because that was one of the things I learned, you know, of traveling all of that time and visiting some really creative teams, was there was definitely a strong association between the environment and the creative team that had landed there. And what I've come to learn is, is that aspect of talent acquisition and talent retention, they want to be inspired both by the team that they work with and their environment. And um, it's one small piece of, 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 of really attracting the talent that we bring to St. Louis is that environment that we show them. So with that, I think I've hit about 15 minutes or so. Um, this is a small collection of our team here. Um, never, nobody's ever all there at the same time. Um, but a group of talented individuals that are engineers, uh, biologists, uh, chemists, uh, writers, historians. Um, and I'd like to thank the SLDC that was such an instrumental part in helping us get going at Cofactor. Um, y Combinator that, uh, that uh, you know, believed in our story for RNA as a diagnostic. And then uh, more recently, Biogenerator for joining us. Yeah. Yep, yep. So you are finished, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So if you raise your hands, I'll bring the mic over, mainly for the video purposes, so that we can hear the question on the microphone. So anyone, oh, there we go. I will bring the mic over. And please raise your hands. On television, it takes eight minutes to do a DNA. On the news, after you watch the program, it takes two or three months, what is reality? How long does it really take? If you were pushed and said, I need to get this thing out fast, I know it's not eight minutes, but uh, you know, it's, it does it take two or three months or two or three weeks? Yes, I'll give you two answers uh, rather than, than give you the, the disappointing it depends um, answer. Um, so the two answers are, if you know exactly what you're looking for, it could take you probably three hours from beginning to end. If you don't know what you're looking for, and it's more of an all-inclusive view of the entire genome or everything that's going on, um, to generate the data takes about 10 hours. To do the analysis sometimes takes 10 days. So I would say if you kind of drew the line in the middle and the average of, of anything that you might consider, um, things are, things are on, a, on, the, on the realm of about a week turnaround. If, if you didn't have a lot of other complicated things going on, it could be a week. Yeah. Yep. Hold on. Uh, fascinating, uh, I must tell you, because I am from a cancer biology point of view. I, we are developed some technology related to cancer. My simple question is that existing uh, biomarkers, blood-borne biomarkers, mm -hmm. um, which people already, they have been using. How does uh, this technology stand with respect to, I know uh, theoretically RNA should be the, the best one to do that, but still I have not seen a product that's being clinically used. Can you tell something about it? Sure. Um, so a lot of our focus over the last 18 months is building a clinical regulated lab for RNA. And that's actually something that didn't exist a, uh, you know, a year ago uh, in terms of, of you know, a lab using RNA-seq for clinical applications. Um, I believe we're one of probably two groups coming on this year with a clinically regulated lab. Um, but that was something that had to happen first. So to get right to your, your question, is that kind of um, standardization, quality control methods had to be established first. What we're doing now is building on top of that foundation of a clinical lab and looking at specific molecules. Um, if you look into some of our background in our company, we have um, some work and some patents around a specific class of RNAs. They're called circular RNAs. 
and they've been implicated in a number of cancers as well as neurological diseases. So the idea is, is that um, we will be able to use those molecules as markers in tissue, which would really help the pharmaceutical um, um, research and development. But you're exactly right. In order for it to be helpful in, in diagnostics and really in the, in the clinic, it has to be in the blood. And that's exactly the type of work we're involved in now is seeing which of those signals we can see in the blood. So if you had a crystal ball, um, which I know you don't, what are some of the possible exit strategies that you're considering or perhaps what do you communicate to your potential investors? What is your exit strategy? Sure. So um, historically, companies like ours, you know, our company would, might be bucketed into a company that would be called a boutique company. We're very, very focused on a specific technology and applying that technology to an area. Um, obviously, our team wants to build as, as much you know, uh, vertical uh, that we can in order to move a patient sample um, from that patient all the way to a diagnostic report. Um, the reality is, is, is there's kind of stages. One stage is, is the stage we're in right now, which is we are servicing pharmaceutical companies. The big dream to really see the fruition of RNA as a diagnostic is to have these tests in a place like Quest or LabCorp. So that would be a huge win for Cofactor is if, if, if you know, maybe we were a part of a much larger entity that could handle and offer those tests. But you know, maybe we become part of that, or maybe we license out our technology to them. And it's a little too early to say. You got one over here. I yep. think you may have just answered my question. So my question was specifically if you were looking to manufacture the assay and sell the kits to other reference laboratories, or this would be the lab developed test, because you mentioned building your own laboratory. So. Yeah, so we, we built our own laboratory, obviously, to um, be able to develop these type of tests on the scale that we need to in order to you know, service that part of the industry we're focused on. But yeah, being realistic, we are, not, we are set up to, to rapidly develop and assess um, and to offer these at, at that scale um, to see a much larger uptake. Uh, that's a very different business model and a very different type of group than what we've built. Ben, I'm going this way. Hey, th um, that was awesome. Nice to hear you got Y Combinator. We're applying to at the moment, but I had a question about the services part of yep. uh, how you began, right? And uh, we're, we're Talify just on the table over there, and we actually have implementation services that are ne a necessary part. It does also mean that we're repeatable. We know how to. I can see a path. We were profitable last year. Right. I can see a path from here to five million annual recurring. But it's convincing, uh, you know, when you say that, right? So that's the notion of services. When you when you have a product and, and 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 you know the disparity between the two, an investor sometimes has to be, you know, it just looks like services, even though it's not. So I have you faced in all your I, I suppose pitches. Uh, including Y Combinator, um, there's this question of, uh, you know, is that scalable? Is that, you know, do you need 100 people to deliver those services? And what, what do you really mean by services? Is, yeah, how do you no, frame that? Um, definitely. I mean, by far, that's, that's one of the most difficult things for people to wrap their head around is, is um, you know, all of us bucket things in our mind. Okay, this is services, this is products, this is software. Everything's a very different type of company. Um, one of the fortunate things that, that we had, um, I believe very fortunate, is we have some of these you know, very large companies that have done the same model, and they've gone on to be billion dollar um, companies. Um, Foundation Medicine is, is one of them. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is this type of area of um, testing or uh, having, uh, having a lab that offers you know, services as well as products, which are in the form of a, of a test. Um, if you look closely at those things which are called products, and especially in, in our space of diagnostic testing, they're really what I would call productized services. 
they're a very well-defined deliverable on something that you're taking in-house. You are, even though it might be your own proprietary software and such, it's really a service that you are packaging up nicely and, and productizing it. So I think that was the story that I had to tell personally in my path to talk about how we were going to move from a really an unfocused um, you know, CRO uh, services laboratory in the early days that was you know, focused on all of the different, um, or not focused, you know, but servicing all of the different parts of the market. And how we were going to focus on this specific part of the market, we had four products we were going to bring to, mar you know, to market. And we were going to standardize and productize those things so that they fit into you know, this type of model. But you're exactly right. That, that aspect, um, us starting out as a services company, definitely not always seen as a positive. And, and people had to see how that fit into our evolution. All right, I'm going to ask the next question because I have to ask it. How does a group of Wash U guys get connected to Ozzy Osbourne? And what did you do for him? Just curious. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of like any, any good story where it was a, you know, a number of random kind of events. Um, and I think probably one of the most pertinent events was we had a strong relationship with the technology companies that were developing these technologies, number one. And the second aspect was about half of Cofactor um, are musicians. That and, explains it. And in fact, two of our founding, you know, my co-founders um, uh, were actually not only just, you know, run-of-the-mill musicians, they were actually signed musicians that had, you know, had had uh, records out, MCA records, and, and uh, had toured the country before. Um, you know, landing and, and focusing on their scientific career. So I think that association between knowing people in the industry and the technologies and our association to rock, uh, I, I assume, uh, you know, there was a light bulb that went off. And what did you find out from Ozzy? Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, quite, truth, quite truthfully, um, that's a talk that our CSO usually gives because he was very uh, involved in it. It happens to be one of the uh, professional musicians as well. Um, but we found out a lot more than we had anticipated, um, quite honestly. Uh, I will give you just two quick things. Um, one of them was there is a gene um, that is often usually here referred to when uh, it's called alcohol dehydrogenase. And it's a gene that you sometimes hear referred to in the context of uh, the Asian population or the Native American population. And it tends to have a mutation in that gene that does not allow for the uh, processing of alcohol or not efficient processing of alcohol. Um, so if you've ever had you know, a, a friend that has this issue, um, they might have a, a half a beer and their entire face turns red. And they are acting like they've had four or five beers. Um, so Ozzy is kind of the opposite. Um, <laughs> they, they found a mutation in that gene um, that they had never, I don't think that they had ever seen before. Um, like I said, I, I think our CSO knows quite a bit more about this than I do. But uh, um, the speculation was is that as opposed to destroying or, or limiting the function of that, of that protein that breaks down alcohol, this one actually may looked like it was hyperactive and able to break down alcohol much, you know, much more efficiently. So that's one aspect. The other aspect that was interesting was um, this, this aspect that was published called uh, um, the warrior gene and the warrior gene, W-A-R. Um, you either worry or you're ready to fight. And the observation was seen that usually in the population, you usually see one of those mutations or the other. Um, and Ozzy had both. Um, and if you think about, and I, if I think about the time that I spent with him, um, this aspect of being a little bit uncomfortable in a small group of five individuals or six individuals, not really totally comfortable, but this idea that he could then get up on a stage and present you know, to 60,000 people, 100,000 people, um, it, it started to make a little more sense. So, yeah. 
I work for our company and we have an assay for circulating free DNA and we do all of the somatic mutations for oncology under the NCCN guidelines. Um, and our concordance data has been excellent with tissue, as you know with yours. Yeah. It's been interesting as I've gone out to the major institutions with Mayo and Warshu and MD Anderson, that they're not only looking at circulating free DNA, but they're also looking at microRNA yep. and using all of the platforms. And it's, it's been quite an eye opener and the increase in percentage of detection uh, for these patients and being able to determine what, what is a driver. I'm interested, is that what you were thinking when you looked into the San Francisco company? through Stanford? It, it was. I mean, this, which you've just mentioned, which is um, there's not any one solution which gives you 100% confidence in any one, you know, um, conclusion. Uh, actually, what you've just highlighted is very much our company's strategy, which is what are the areas where DNA testing has already been accepted, where we can follow on with RNA testing as a complement and it, and it gives a little bit more confidence and um, additional information um, to the story. And I think cell-free DNA is actually, that's, that's a great area. And you should, you know, maybe you can come and give a talk about that here because that is, that's a really great area. And, and um, arguably one of the few areas where, where DNA is really powerful at monitoring. Um, and I, I'm really excited about that area. Um, the question regarding the San Francisco uh, acquisition. So when we found these certain class of molecules that were going to be, they, they had early um, evidence they would be helpful for detection and early detection of disease, they were implicated in cancer and these neurological diseases. We actually, that's a funny story in and of itself, um, the San Francisco uh, company that we acquired were actually clients of ours. And they were sending things through Cofactor. And when I saw their experimental design and the things they were working on, I said to our CSO, we have to punt this. We can't work on this. This is too similar to our path and where we're going to be going. We have to tell them there's a conflict of interest and we can't work on this. And really, to the credit of our CSO, um, there's a theme here. I, I surround myself with a lot of people that are smarter than me. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to his credit, he said, let me sit down and talk to them because in the last, you know, seven years or eight years of working, I've never ran into a group that's interested in exactly the same direction, exactly in the same area that we're interested in. And that was really the, the, the start of the genesis of what eventually became an acquisition for the group to join us. Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question specifically. Okay. Um, I know that, you know, since you've been with Y Combinator, you've spent, you told me you spent about half your time in St. Louis, about half your time um, out, out in San Francisco. I'm just mm -hmm. curious, what, 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 what differences have you noted between their startup ecosystem and our startup ecosystem, and where do you think they have advantages, and where do you think we have advantages? Yeah, I just, um, I don't know if anybody here, I actually was thinking about that a little bit yesterday, and, and really to the credit of Audrey, um, who is, who's my personal assistant and actually a, a phenomenal writer, um, we started brainstorming and thinking about that exact question. And I, write, I wrote a small blog post yesterday, um, said, and in, 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 entitled it, uh, St. Louis is not a cheaper San Francisco, and that's okay. Um, and what I did was highlight you know, that, that all of these cities that I spend time in, whether it's Boston or San Francisco or St. Louis or Austin or Portland, um, each one of them has their own you know, benefits and, and also their own challenges. And um, the thing that I wrote up yesterday, which was interesting to see the, the thing that came out of I-10 actually last night, which actually echoed the exact same thing that I said, was um, the benefits. Um, I, let me start with the challenges. That is all end in the benefits. I always want to end on a positive note. The, the challenges for a company like ours were that there was early capital available, and then there was kind of a trough of, of or a, 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 you know, an absence of kind of this mid capital. Um, but it looks like there was, you know, availability for much larger capital for more serious, larger series A or series B rounds. But this kind of seed round um, in the realm of like $1 million to $5 million, 
Um, that, was a, that was a tough time for our company was to find that here in this region. And we had to go elsewhere in order to find that. Um, so that was one of the challenges. Um, the number two challenge is uh, anytime we find really great talent that we're interviewing, and many times that's you know, in Boston or San Francisco, even out of the country, I insist that we bring them here and before we give them any offer. And we show them our environment. We take them to all the great places San Francisco has, I mean, uh, St. Louis has to offer. I, I'm thinking about bringing people here from San Francisco recently. Um, but uh, that talent acquisition is also very difficult. And quite truthfully, you know, we're only successful maybe, you know, maybe one third of the time. Um, so that continues to be a challenge for us. And, um, and uh, people are catching on. They love our facility, they love our group, and we're getting more successful as time goes on. Uh, but it is a, it is a challenge. Um, and so the benefits, I would say, is the thing I wrote about was um, when we interview people from the coast versus interview people here locally, and I ask how they would rate themselves on a one to 10 on given areas of expertise that I need them for their job, I usually have to discount people on the coast by about minus three. <laughs> And people locally here are very humble. I usually have to add three to whatever they tell me. And I think that's, that's number one. That you know, speaks a lot about how humble people are here, about how talented they are. The number two benefit here is um, it usually takes about a year of bringing somebody on the team for them to really be firing on all eight cylinders and really contributing. And that's what I love about St. Louis is you bring somebody on the team and they're, they're here for the, for the long haul. They're committed. Um, it gets a little concerning when you look on the coast and you see somebody that's changed a job every nine months or every 12 months for the last seven years. That's a little concerning as somebody that's trying to build a business. Yeah. Spoken like an entrepreneur. <laughs> One more question, actually over here, sorry Jim. Uh, and then we're gonna wrap this up, so hold on. Is your technology translatable to insects, animals, fish, and plants? Huh. We'll take that as a no. Yeah, I, I'm, so I'm trying to think about the, the, the RNAs that we are looking at, and they've been found to be very enriched in the mammalian brain. And these circular RNAs are, are, are uh, the diversity and the number is something specific to the mammalian brain. So with that, I don't know how translatable it is to you know, definitely insects or other, um, other animals. I suspect there's models for regulation and gene regulation there. It's just following a different model than, than these certain class of RNAs that we're focused on for biomarkers. Yeah, so the answer is no. <laughs> All right, let's, I'd like to thank our speaker. This, I think it was a very- Thanks a lot. <laughs>